Soyuz MS-18 spacecraft carrying a cosmonaut and two space flight participants landed in Kazakhstan on October 17, marking the end of Expedition 65 and the start of Expedition 66 aboard the space station. On board the Soyuz was Roscosmos cosmonaut Oleg Novitsky, returning from 191 days in space. Also on board were space flight participants Yulia Parasold and Klim Shipenko, who flew to the station on the Soyuz MS-19 spacecraft that launched on October 5. Parasold and Shipenko were on the station to shoot scenes for a Russian movie Vizov, or The Challenge. A Russian Progress supply ship docked with the new Nauka Lab module at the International Space Station on October 22, completing a 29-hour free flight after detaching from a different port at the complex. On Wednesday, the Progress MS-17 supply ship undocked from the space station's Poisk module and backed away from the orbital outpost to a distance of 185 kilometers. The Progress began a new approach to the complex utilizing space-based navigation and a Kurs rendezvous radar system after it was at the proper distance from the station. On Friday, the automated approach culminated in docking with the Nauka module. The docking was the first between a Progress cargo freighter and the Nauka module, which arrived at the space station on July 29. The relocation positions Progress MS-17 to perform leak checks of the Nauka module's propellant lines before using the new module's thrusters for orientation control of the station. Boeing announced on October 19 that the company is aiming for the test flight of Starliner capsule to the International Space Station in the first half of next year and a potential launch of its crewed spacecraft to the space station at the end of 2022. The CST-100 uncrewed mission had been scheduled to fly to the space station on August 3, but the flight was aborted just hours before launch because of problems with propulsion system valves. Boeing has still been unable to identify the root cause of the anomaly. The company believes that the leading cause was that nitrogen tetroxide oxidizer permeating Teflon seals in the valves interacted with moisture and created nitric acid that corroded the valves and caused them to stick in the closed position. Technicians have removed two of the valves from the spacecraft and are working on removing a third valve. Those valves will go to NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center for detailed studies, including CT scans to get a look at their insides. According to John Vollmer, vice president and program manager of the commercial crew program at Boeing, the company plans to install heaters in the valve system to break up corrosion products and add desiccants to soak up moisture as well. A design review for that is scheduled for the coming days. On October 20, NASA's Artemis 1 mission's Orion spacecraft was lifted atop its Space Launch System rocket, completing the assembly of the entire vehicle stack. The 33.5 metric ton Orion spacecraft arrived in the vehicle assembly building early Tuesday, after a 10 kilometer journey from the Launch Abort System facility, where technicians installed the capsule's Launch Abort System. Early Wednesday, a crane lifted the spacecraft off the floor and raised it over the transom into the Northeast High Bay. The crane carefully loaded the craft on top of the Space Launch System rocket, which stands on its mobile launch platform. Mating the spacecraft to the launch vehicle was accomplished in two phases, a soft mate followed by a hard mate. After that, the structural attachment, electrical and data connections between Orion and SLS, and the umbilical connections from the mobile launcher to the spacecraft were completed. NASA is currently planning to conduct an end-to-end -end communication test with the SLS and Orion following the spacecraft's power-up test and the avionics health test. That test will demonstrate that signals can travel between the SLS, Orion, and NASA's control centers. Those tests lead toward the first rollout of the Space Launch System to Pad 39B at Kennedy Space Center for a practice countdown and fueling test, called a wet dress rehearsal. After completing the wet dress rehearsal, the launch vehicle will roll back to the vehicle assembly building for final outfitting for the Artemis 1 mission. The wet dress rehearsal is currently scheduled for later December. The Artemis 1 mission's intended launch date has yet to be declared by NASA, but with the practice countdown set for late December, the rocket is unlikely to launch until early 2022. South Korea has conducted the first test launch of its domestically built rocket, dubbed Nuri, on October 21, joining the ranks of advanced space-faring nations. The three-stage rocket emblazoned with South Korea's flag and carrying a dummy satellite blasted off from Narrow Space Center in Gohyung on Thursday evening. The 47.2 meters long and 3.5 meters diameter rocket weighs 200,000 kilograms and is fitted with a total of six liquid-fueled engines. The rocket's first stage consists of four KRE-075 engines, which combine to produce 2,942 kilonewtons of thrust at sea level. The second and third stages each contain one vacuum variant of the same engine. All six engines use jet fuel and liquid oxygen as propellants. 
During the flight, the rocket reached the intended altitude of 700 kilometers as planned, but its third stage engine shut down 46 seconds early, releasing its 1,500 kilogram dummy payload at less than orbital speed. The third stage engine was supposed to burn for 521 seconds, but it stopped burning in 475 seconds. The speed of the stage was 6.7 km per second instead of the 7.5 km per second required during payload deployment. South Korea's previous rocket, Nero, made its first successful launch in 2013 on the third attempt, carrying a 100 kg satellite on its milestone launch. South Korea plans to make another test flight of Nuri in May. When Nuri operates properly, it will become South Korea's first rocket capable of lifting 1,000 kilograms into Earth orbit, a feat that only six countries have accomplished entirely domestically. Days after NASA's Lucy mission to the mysterious group of Trojan asteroids launched, spacecraft personnel continues battling an issue with one of the vehicle's two massive solar arrays. Lucy was launched into space on October 16 atop an Atlas V rocket from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. After the spacecraft separated from the rocket's upper stage, it began deploying its two 7-meter diameters circular solar arrays. However, NASA only received confirmation that one of the solar arrays was fully unfurled and latched. The second array partially opened and did not latch to the spacecraft. The large array size is necessary as the spacecraft will be operating about 778 million kilometers from the sun during its 12-year mission. According to NASA, both arrays were providing power to Lucy and charging batteries on the spacecraft. Also in the current spacecraft attitude, Lucy can continue to operate with no threat to its health and safety. Lucy's team confirmed that the spacecraft could fire its thrusters using the current configuration of the solar arrays, but it is not yet clear how the latching issue will affect long-term operations and maneuvering. The team is analyzing spacecraft data to understand the situation and determine the next steps to fully deploy the solar array. Hopefully, the project's experts will be able to repair the panel during Lucy's solo trip to the Trojans. Nanorax, a private in-space services company based in Houston, announced on October 21 that it was partnering with Lockheed Martin and Voyager Space on a commercial space station called Starlab. Starlab would consist of a docking node with an inflatable module attached to one side and a spacecraft bus providing power and propulsion attached to the other side. Starlab will also have a volume of 340 cubic meters, about three-eighths of the International Space Station. Starlab will be equipped with a robotic arm and a state-of-the-art lab and be able to host four astronauts at a time. Nanorax will be the mission's prime contractor, with Voyager Space handling strategy and investment, and Lockheed Martin serving as the manufacturer and technical integrator. The companies are among many seeking to participate in NASA's commercial Low Earth Orbit Destinations program, which will provide funding for initial studies of commercial space stations, then certify those stations for use by NASA astronauts. The companies did not disclose the estimated cost of the project, but said that Starlab could reach an initial operational capability as soon as 2027. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. Starship 20, SpaceX's first orbital-class Starship prototype, has set new ground records during its maiden static fire test after weeks of meticulous preparation. On October 21, SpaceX's Ship 20 blazed to life during the first static fire test of its vacuum-optimized Raptor engine. Two days before the static fire test, on October 19, the ship performed a different kind of hot fire test, completing what is known as a pre-burner test. SpaceX's Raptor engines are full-flow staged combustion engines that have two pre-burners, one fuel-rich and one oxidizer-rich. Pre-burners are essentially mini-combustion chambers that burn propellant to create hot gas that is channeled through a turbine at high pressures to power turbopumps. These turbopumps on the vacuum variant Raptor were put to the test on Tuesday to make sure they were performing as expected. Over the previous year, SpaceX has only produced and tested about 10 RVAC prototypes, making it a less mature engine than its sea-level counterparts. That could explain why SpaceX chose to conduct a pre-burner test first, rather than jumping straight into a static fire. SpaceX conducted a second static fire test an hour after the first test, employing both sea-level and vacuum-optimized Raptors. If you take a close look at this video from Lab Padre, you can see both Raptors firing at the same time, marking the first simultaneous static fire of two distinct Raptor variants. The two-test surprise on Ship 20 was the fastest back-to-back -back static fire SpaceX has ever conducted, beating Starship SN9 by around 15 minutes. Meanwhile, during the static fire testing, some of the heat shield tiles fell off the ship, surprising the viewers.
However, this came as no surprise to SpaceX CEO Elon Musk, who stated on Twitter that SpaceX expects some tiles to shake loose during static fires. A common concern most rocket enthusiasts had was the possibility of flow separation when test firing a vacuum-optimized engine at sea level. But Musk clarified that the high chamber pressure of the Raptor engine allows the company to test the vacuum version of the engine at sea level conditions without suffering significant separation of the exhaust from the nozzle. Hours after the static fire test, two sea level Raptor engines were transported to the launch site and both were eventually installed on the ship. This hints that another static fire test possibly involving all the three sea level Raptors is on the horizon. Perhaps in the coming days, SpaceX will install the remaining vacuum-optimized engines into the ship and proceed towards a six-engine static fire. Currently, road closures are scheduled for Monday and Tuesday from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., most likely for static fire test number three. Booster 4 is in line for its cryo-proof and static fire tests, but this isn't expected to happen until November. Booster 4's static fire campaign, with its 29 engines, will almost certainly involve many ignitions with a rising number of engines. SpaceX is currently removing engines from the booster and moving them to the build site one by one. It's unclear why SpaceX is doing this and whether or not all of the booster engines will be removed. Installation of thermal protection covers on the booster engines is in progress. These covers protect the Raptor's plumbing and wiring from extreme heat during atmospheric re-entry. Heat shields are also used on the Falcon 9 rockets to protect the vehicle's nine Merlin engines from re-entry heating. On October 20, SpaceX engineers installed the booster catching arm, dubbed Mechazilla Chopsticks, to the 145-meter-high orbital launch tower. Prior to the installation, SpaceX technicians staged 12 guide blocks on three of the launch tower's four legs. These guide blocks, two upper and two lower blocks per leg, will allow the carriage and arms to slide up and down the tracks. After lifting and placing the catching arm on the tower on Wednesday, SpaceX employees carefully connected the carriage to the guide blocks with several large pins. Later, after the catching arm was fully secured on the tower, the crane holding the arms and the carriage was detached from the system. The arm is currently resting on the lower end of the tower track. Meanwhile, work is progressing on the draw work mechanism required to raise and lower the booster catching arm. The draw works installation process may take a few weeks to complete. The U.S. Federal Aviation Administration recently held two public hearings about its environmental assessment of SpaceX's orbital launch activities at Starbase. The public comment process included two virtual public hearings held via Zoom on October 18 and 20, and 120 people voiced their opinions on the project's environmental impacts. The public hearings showed a wide range of opinions on SpaceX's plans to launch rockets from Boca Chica. Many of the guests were enthusiastic supporters of the company and the proposed launch location, describing it as crucial to the nation's space future. They also downplayed the impact on the environment, comparing it to the launch sites at Cape Canaveral in Florida, which are surrounded by a wildlife refuge. Opponents of SpaceX's plans argued that the environmental consequences are already severe and called on the FAA to require the development of an environmental impact statement, a more detailed environmental review, before issuing a launch license. There was some nuance during the public comments though. A few speakers wanted more information about elements of the company's plans, such as a 250-megawatt power plant and transportation and storage of methane. The FAA will continue accepting public comments through November 1, then incorporate those thoughts into its final assessment. SpaceX cannot launch the Starship and Super Heavy vehicle until the FAA completes its environmental review and licensing process. On the other hand, via a tweet on Friday, Musk said that Starship 20 will be ready for its first orbital launch attempt in November, pending regulatory approval. Moving on to other Starship updates, the final two cryo shells were transported to the launch site last week, and they were later installed over GSE tanks 7 and 8. With this, the tank farm cryo shell installations have been completed, while plumbing work to connect the GSE tanks to the orbital launch mount is still in progress. Two big horizontal tanks arrived at the launch site last week and are now positioned near the tank farm. It is speculated that these tanks may replace the custom-built methane tanks already installed on the tank farm or that they may be used to store reserve propellants. Construction of the proposed second high bay near the existing high bay is in progress. The first steel column of the wide bay was erected last week. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.